On the tall ridges and shorter peaks, Laka establishes in the mountains. Laka lives as Earth's breath. In Kona, rain follows the forest. Here, on the leeward side of Hawaii Island, the coast is sunny and dry, but in the mountains, Lono comes, and the mist, Noe, settles over the trees, and the rain falls. Recognizing the cycle of Ohu rising and Noe settling, bringing water, Hawaiians protected the forest and managed the landscape from the volcanoes to the sea as a single unit, the Ahupua'a. Private ownership of land marks modern Kona, largely decoupling coastal development from montane water sources. Though Captain Cook first set foot in Hawaii on the Kona coast, the emergence of Kona as a major tourist destination is relatively recent. Over the past 25 years, the area has transitioned from a largely rural district to a vacation mecca, and continued population growth is projected. Tourist dollars now form the economic engine of Leeward Hawaii, and rapid development has raised a variety of concerns within the community. One of the most pressing is whether there is adequate water to support increasing population. While locals have traditionally lived on the mountain slopes, where it rains in the afternoon and basins and tanks can be filled from rooftop runoff, resorts and vacation homes now cluster along the coast, where it is arid and warm year-round. Modern residents and visitors to Kona depend on wells to sate their thirst. The first wells were shallow, near the coast, but as more water was pumped for showers, laundry, landscaping, and golf, the water became salty and unpalatable. Inland aquifers were discovered in the 1980s with clean and apparently abundant water, but the wells are deep, nearly 1,700 feet, so lifting water is expensive and maintenance intensive. In many ways, these new wells have solved Kona's water problem, but as population grows, drawing down the aquifer is a persistent concern. Drought is a twofold threat, decreasing recharge and simultaneously swelling demand as households increase irrigation to maintain their lawns and plantings. Limited water resources have more than once been proposed as a limit to growth. Kona's water comes from the mountains. A convective weather system brings rain and fog to mountain slopes below the inversion layer. Here, just 10 kilometers inland but a thousand meters above sea level, clouds settle in the early afternoon. Light rain falls and dense fog moves across a landscape dominated by forest and pasture. The forest is native Ohia forest, evergreens endemic to Hawaii. They form an open, gappy canopy 20 to 30 meters above the ground. Below, hapu'u, tree ferns, form a dense mid-canopy. Cattle graze in the open pasture land. There are few trees. They have been replaced by a thick mat of invasive African veldt grass. Both the forest and the pasture are privately owned and managed. Contractors and cowboys spray pesticides on fast-growing invasives, maintain access roads, and rebuild walls to keep cattle in and out. But labor and supplies come with a price, and although landowners have a strong commitment to maintaining their property, they need financial returns on their investment and are vulnerable to development pressure. Landowners and water users have begun to ask, how will water be affected as land use changes? Might the water department pay for maintaining or changing some kinds of land cover? We explored these questions using a water balance approach. Because there are no streams, rainfall that reaches the ground must either return to the atmosphere via evaporation and transpiration, or else soak into the ground, eventually recharging the aquifer. We installed weather stations to monitor the drivers of evapotranspiration and gauges to measure rainfall and throughfall in pasture and forest. Due to regular ground level clouds, humidity is high, and the drivers of evapotranspiration are low in both pasture and forest. The pasture grass grows vigorously, while the forests are mature and dominated by a particularly slow-growing hardwood. Our preliminary results suggest that pasture evapotranspiration is nearly twice that of forest, but both values are low. Rain falls regularly, but lightly. In 2007, we measured only 750 millimeters of rain, half the long-term annual average at these sites, with an average storm intensity of just over one millimeter per hour. Much of the rain is captured by the leaves and stalks of trees and grasses, never reaching the ground surface. In the forest, however, 
Direct interception of fog increases through fall. The Hawaiian proverb holds true here. Rain follows the forest. At these sites, noe, or fog, contributes at least 12 to 27 percent of total water input. Differences in forest structure account for the range of fog interception. Though the two forest sites have the same vegetation, the site with more fog interception is taller and denser, providing nearly 40 percent more intercepting canopy. The most likely cause of differences in structure is land use history. Cattle have been excluded from the denser site for nearly 70 years, while they were removed from the less dense site only seven years ago. Cattle grazing on seedlings and trampling small plants could easily decrease forest density. While this illustrates a trade-off between water input from fog interception and income from grazing cattle in the forest, Kona's mountain slopes provide many additional services. The forests are important sources of plant materials for traditional Hawaiian practices, sheltering maile for leis and mamake for tea. The forest sites are owned by a native Hawaiian educational institution, which wants to preserve them and make the resources accessible for education and cultural practice. Local recreational groups clamor for access for hunting and hiking. The flora and fauna here are endemic and endangered. Hawaiians and scientists worry about increased human traffic bringing invasive species and fear the destruction of seedlings by the wild pigs and sheep that are valued for hunting. Some ranchers consider converting pasture land to tree plantation, providing habitat for native birds, sequestering carbon, and providing long-term financial payoff with high-value timber. But fast-growing plantation trees require substantial water, and the simple structure of plantations reduces fog interception, diminishing groundwater recharge. Carbon and water are often objects of payments for ecosystem services because markets and payments for these goods already exist. But managing for only one service almost universally lowers the overall value of the ecosystem services flowing from a parcel of land. Timber is a classic example. In Hawaii, eucalyptus grows quickly to maturity but has little value for cultural practices, maintaining biodiversity, or for water supply. Because their lands are the sole source of water for urban supply, a number of landowners have looked into payments for water to bring in extra revenue. However, interviews with the Department of Water Supply and self-supplying resort developers suggest that direct payments are unlikely, at least for the time being. Investors require a more concrete connection between a parcel designated for supply and the portion of the aquifer feeding a specific well than the complex hydrogeology of Kona allows. The Water Department considers land use to be outside of its purview. Although underground passage of water is fast in these young basalts, the estimated 10-year travel time is longer than a developer's investment horizon. Perhaps most importantly, while it is clear that changes in land cover affect recharge, in Kona, a substantial fraction of fresh water is discharged to the ocean, so changes in recharge have a blunted effect on aquifer levels. Developers in the county need water and will outlay six to eight million to put in a well and then spend hundreds of thousands per year to pump it. But because incremental changes in water level do not reflect long-term drawdown of the aquifer, the impact on long-term decision-making and on total pumping expenditures is minimal. Nevertheless, water scarcity is a persistent concern within the community and remains a political lever for slowing development. While we have demonstrated measurable benefit in terms of the cost of water extraction given certain kinds of land management, these benefits are not large enough for spontaneous implementation. The overall effects of land conversion must be assessed directly and holistically. Payments for water services will not be a panacea, but they may be one way to engage landowners and downstream beneficiaries in land use decisions. Mm -hmm.